This video is for those of you who are just starting out and want to learn the very basics of animation quickly. With that being said, I'm assuming you all know how to move around your scene and select objects and things like that. If you don't, please, please, please just go watch the Blender Fundamentals playlist on their official YouTube channel. At least the first few videos to get started. It's really good and it'll help you learn the basics. Also stick around to the end and I'll show you how to make this animation right here really quickly. So if you just want to get started really quickly, basically all you need to know is that you select an object, you move it somewhere, you hit I, and you can insert a keyframe. Move to a different spot on your timeline, move it again, and insert another keyframe. And then when you play it back, it's animated. And here's the rest for everybody else. So this is just like a default Blender scene right here. Uh, all the factory settings are the same, and I'm using version 2.91, but this video should work for anything 2.8 or later. So you'll see if we select the cube, it doesn't give us an option to move it. You have to use the hotkeys with G for grab, R for rotate, and S to scale. If you don't want to use the hotkeys, what I like to do is go up here over to the gizmos, and you can drop that down and check off these boxes for move, rotate, and scale. Um, I like to just use the move one so that we can move it around by just dragging these arrows right here. And if you don't see this cube for some reason, you can add one in with Shift A, Mesh, and then add a cube. Next, we'll talk about Transform Info. So you'll see when we select our cube um, over here on the side, it gives us options for changing the location, rotation, and scale. Um, and if you don't see this, you just have to click this button on the sidebar. It's called Object Properties. And if you don't want to use this area because you're on like a different tab or something like that, you can uh, hover over your viewport and hit N, and the side panel will pop up. Um, you can also just drag this little arrow right here and it'll pop out too. So all of these values can be keyed right here, except for dimensions. Basically what you need to know is if you want to change like the scale, just, just affect the scale right here. Don't worry about the dimensions. So to insert a keyframe, you can just hover over any of these fields, right click and insert keyframe. If you want to insert on only one of these fields right here, you can right click and insert single keyframe like that. You can also hover over and hit I on any of these fields right here. You can also select your object and right click on that and choose insert keyframe, or you can just with it selected hit I, and it'll give you these options right here. The basic ones you need to worry about are location, rotation, scale, and then these next few are just a combination of all of those. You'll see if I select location, it only affects the location, obviously. And if I select location, rotation, scale, it'll insert a keyframe for all of those fields right there. So when these are highlighted, you know that we're uh, on a keyframe, that these are keyed somewhere on our timeline, which is down at the bottom. Um, you'll see we have like a little diamond right here, and that just indicates where the keyframe is. Um, if you don't see your timeline down here, you can just go to like where your windows meet in the corner, and you can just drag that up to create a new window. And then on the side, you just want to click that and select timeline. If it's hard for you to control dragging from the corner like that, you can also just right click and you have these options right here. So here on our timeline, you can affect the playhead, basically what frame you're on by just um, left clicking and dragging. You can also select this right here by just clicking and dragging and that will also move the playhead. You can change where your um, scene starts and where it ends right here. And you can also just hit the left and right arrow keys to go frame by frame. And when you're just starting out, it's really helpful to just like open up a new window and just kind of look at all of the options you have right here. And don't worry about messing things up because nothing will save in your startup scene unless you decide to save it. So over here in our timeline, if you click off of the keyframe, it will deselect it right there. You can see it turned white. And you, to select it again, you just want to click it right there. And if you don't see it at all, it's because your object is probably not selected, so you just have to make sure your object is selected. And then you can click that keyframe and hit G to move it around, or you can just click and drag it. And with it selected to remove, you can just um, hit X and delete. So I'm just going to insert a, key a few keyframes. I'll just click on Z location right here and hit 5, and it'll move up a little. And then I'm going to hover over this and hit I. And then I'm going to frame 50, and I'm going to hit Alt-G to clear the location. You can see it just went back to zero over here. You can also do that with rotation and scale with Alt R and Alt S, and that'll reset those also. And then I'm just going to hit I over here again. And you can see we have a little animation now. So I'm just going to quickly talk about these options up here. We have this, which is play, and we have play in reverse. And if you hover over those, it tells you what it is and also tells you the shortcut. 
So this, we have jump to keyframe um, with the up and down arrow. You can see it just lands directly on the keyframe right there. And we also have jump to the end um, and the beginning with shift left and right like that. It'll jump to the end and the beginning of the timeline. And then we have auto keying, which I'll talk about in just a second. And I just want to also mention that if you scroll, if you use the scroll wheel, it'll zoom in and out. And you can go left and right by middle clicking and dragging and up and down also, which doesn't seem like it would be very useful because we only have these two keyframes right here. But if you drag open this side panel right here, it'll give you a summary with some more info. So you can see the name of our object cube. If you drop down object transformations, it'll show you all the fields that you have keyed right there. And you can select those individually and move them around to with G or once again with left click and drag. And that won't affect the value. It'll only affect um, the start and end point of that particular animation. So to explain auto keying, I'm just going to select everything and delete all those keyframes. And then I'm going to turn auto keying on. And this is basically an alternative to hitting I to insert keyframes. So if I just move this, you'll see it inserts a frame on our timeline. And it won't insert just by you pressing this button right here. You have to, uh, with this on, you have to move it in some way, like uh, rotate it or scale it. And you can see it's not inserting multiple. Every time you move it, it'll overwrite unless you move to a different frame right there, like that. One cool thing about this feature is it works when it's playing also. So if we hit spacebar and then G, you can see it's inserting a bunch of keyframes at the bottom. And when I left click and play that again, you can see it's, it's like it recorded all my movements. You just want to make sure that when you're done inserting keyframes, you just turn this off. That way you don't insert any accidentally, which is really easy to do. So if you want more animation options, you should go over here and turn this to the dope sheet. And you can see a few of these things changed up here. Once again, I recommend just kind of poking around up here, um, hovering over things to see what each one is. The thing about the dope sheet that I find most useful is this key option right here. You click that and it gives you a bunch of different options you can look through. Um, mainly these four right here, easing mode, interpolation mode, handle types, and keyframe type. I'm not going to talk about all of them. If you want a more in-depth tutorial about all of these things, maybe let me know in the comments below. The main one I want to talk about is interpolation mode. If you select one of your keyframes and go over here to interpolation mode, you can also see the shortcut right here is T. By default, this is set to Bezier, and that just means that it starts off slow, gets fast in the middle, and then ends slow also. You can see it's like starts off slow and is kind of gently being placed downward. And if I change this to linear, it'll stay the same rate the whole time. So it'll be more robotic and rigid. And just like timeline, we have the summary over here. And the cool thing is you can also search. Say we have a whole bunch of objects over here, but you want to only affect the Z location of all of those. You can just search Z location like that. And you know only the Z locations will show up. And you can also affect these by just hovering over and hitting uh, plus and minus on your, uh, your numpad. So you can see I changed the interpolation mode, but visually it's not the most clear thing, especially when we use more complex ones like this effect over here called bounce. You can see it looks kind of like a bouncing ball, but it's hard to tell over here, like, oh, when's it going to hit the ground first? Like, there's no spot for that over here. So if you want more visual info like that, I recommend instead of using the dope sheet, you can click over here and go to the graph editor. You can also go quickly back and forth by hovering over and uh, using control tab. This also works with the timeline. It will switch directly to the graph editor with control tab. So you can see over here, if you uh, select everything with A and hit period on your numpad, it'll kind of zoom in on everything for you. You can see it's actually showing you visually what's happening now. So even though we only have two keyframes, you can still tell the first hit is going to be right here on frame 19, like that. And one main difference is uh, we now have like two axes. So left and right is time, just like it was before. And up and down is actually the value of the keyframe. So you can see over here on frame one, it's right at this line. Um, and if we scroll over, you can see that says five. And if you check the value up here, that says five also. If we select that and move it up, 
it'll actually change the value over here also. So this can be really helpful um, if you don't want to keep moving things and re-inserting uh, keyframes right there. You can just affect it over here. And it's also more apparent, you know, what the interpolation types are doing. So I'm going to insert another keyframe over here just so I can explain something a little more easily. So since we're only animating the z-axis, I'm just going to select the x and y location and just delete those. And I'd just like to explain really quickly that the bounce is only appearing right here because I only applied it to this keyframe. I only had this keyframe selected when I chose bounce. And that's important to know that, you know, for instance, if I select this and change the interpolation, it's going to visually like appear on the right, like going forward in time. Say, for instance, if I wanted um, it to bounce here and bounce here, I would have to change the interpolation mode of this one right here because I want it to be bouncing to the right of it. So you can change these separately. You don't have to, you know, each frame can have its own interpolation type. Another thing to mention is that if you wanted this for some reason to play backwards, you might um, think that you could just kind of flip it around, but it doesn't exactly work that way. You would actually have to affect the easing type right here. So by default, I believe it's set to automatic easing, but more more likely it's set to ease out. Um, you can see if I choose that, it stays the same. But if I select ease in, it'll actually go backwards now. And the shortcut for that is control E. And if I set this to ease in and out, you'll see it kind of like mirrors in the middle. Like it starts off bouncing in reverse and then finishes bouncing forward like that. And that can be a pretty interesting effect too, especially when you use these ones in the middle. Next, we should talk about if you want to render this, how you would set that up. So I'm just going to change this back to our timeline. And you can see we only have 100 frames, so I'm just going to change the end position to 100. And you just want to click this button over here for output properties. You can see it has the output resolution right here. 100% um, just means that these are accurate. If you were to put 50%, it would basically take this, divide it by two, take this, divide it by two, and that's what you'd be left with as your uh, final resolution. And you also have your frame rate right here. It's important that you set an output location right here to something other than temp because that's in like a temporary folder that's hard to find. So I'm just going to set mine to a folder on the desktop right here, and you can add a new folder with this button right there. And I'm just going to name that temp because it's temporary. You just want to go in that, select it, and hit accept. You can also uh, put a name right here if you want it to be named something specific. And then file format is important. If you leave this set to PNG or something like JPEG, it'll output your animation as an image sequence. I recommend rendering as an image sequence just because it allows you to stop your render in the middle if you want and then restart it later. Whereas if you try to do that with a video, it's not really gonna work very well. It'll output a partial video. Also, it's important to note that we have this set to RGBA right now, which means it allows for transparency. If you're not worried about transparency, I'd, I'd change this to RGB. Um, your file size will be slightly smaller. If you want this to be a video, you can select FFmpeg video, and then you wanna go down to encoding and change this from Matroska to M MPEG-4 or MP4. The video codec, this is fine, it should be H.264. And then you can change the quality over here. And if you have any audio, which we don't, but if you do have audio, you can um, change this to either AAC or MP3. And then to render, you can basically just go up to render and render animation. Before you render, you wanna make sure that your camera is set up. So if you don't have a camera in your scene like I do by default, you can also add one of those in with Shift A and then just select camera right here. So you can hit zero on your numpad to look through your camera. And you can see right now our cube is not on screen. To move this around easily, you can select a view on our side panel right here and then select uh, lock camera to view. And now when you move around, your camera will follow. So you can just set that up. And then when you're done, you just want to check this again. It's also important to note that when you render it, it's going to use the rendered shading right here. And before we were in solid mode, and it's, it's not going to look like that when you render it. If you want to render it exactly how you're seeing it with all the overlays and everything, instead of selecting render up at the top, you can select a view, which is part of your viewport, and scroll down to viewport render animation or viewport render image. And that will actually give you all the overlays and basically just render it exactly the way you're seeing it. So I'm just quickly going to render this as an image sequence so that I can show you how to uh, compile it as a video. You'll know this is done when it re reads your uh, final frame right here. 
So to compile that into a video now, you can just go to File, New, and then Video Editing. Just make sure you save your scene first if you don't want to lose it. And in here, you can set up your output settings. And this time we are outputting it as a video, so just make sure that you set it accordingly like I showed earlier. And over here, you can either go to Add Image Sequence. You can just hover over that and hit Shift A and then Add Image Sequence. And then just navigate to the folder that you saved it in. You can just highlight everything and add image strip. And it'll preview it for you up here. And you can see this is going longer than we need it to. And that's because our timeline right here is set to 250. And we know that this strip is only 100 frames. So we can just reset that to 100. And now if you want to render this on our video sequencer window, you just want to select a view and scroll down to sequence render animation right here. And when you do that, it'll render the video out for you wherever you uh, set the output location right here. Okay, so I said I'd show you how to make that animation in the beginning. And so to do that, we're just going to restart a new scene. You just want to delete that default cube. And I'm going to Shift A to add in a plane right here. And I'm just going to zoom in on that. And then I'm going to, with that selected, hit Tab to go into edit mode. You can see we're in edit mode up here. And I'm just going to right click and subdivide. And this will give us some more geometry. You just want to change the number of cuts to something bigger. I'm going to change mine to 50. And then I'm going to hit tab to leave edit mode. Next, we're going to select this wrench right here. It's the modifier properties. And I'm going to add a displacement modifier. And I'm going to hit new to add a new texture. And then right here, I'm going to hit this. It'll go into our texture tab. And instead of image or movie, I'm going to select clouds. And you can see our mesh is a little different now. It's actually uh, using this texture right here. Um, all the light spots it's pushing uh, upward and all the dark spots it's, it's pushing downward. And if you want, you can change this around right here to whatever you want. I'm not gonna worry about that right now. I'm gonna hit our uh, modifier properties again and you can change the strength of that. I'm just gonna make mine a little more subtle. And you can see we have a coordinates field right here. Ours is set to local, which means when we move our object around, the texture follows it. If I set this to global, you can see that when I move our object around, the texture doesn't follow it. It stays in the same place like that. I'm going to set ours to object, which means the texture will be controlled by a separate object. But we only have one object here right now, so I'm going to add a new one in with Shift A. I'm going to choose an empty, and this is basically just like a reference object. So I'm going to choose plane axis, select our plane again, and for object, you can hit the eyedropper right here and just select that empty. Now you can see when we move our empty around, the texture follows it. So if you didn't guess already, what we're going to do is animate the empty right here. So I'm just going to move that up very slightly. And we're actually going to rotate this on the Y axis like this. We're on frame one right now. I'm, I'm just going to go to frame zero and I'm going to hit I over rotation to insert a keyframe. And then I'm going to the very last frame, which is uh, frame 250 for us right now. And I'm going to change the Y rotation to 360. So it'll just go all the way around. And I'm going to hit I again. You can see when we play it, the easing is set to Bezier by default. So with both of our keyframes selected, I'm just going to hit T and change that to linear. So it moves the same speed the whole time. And when it gets to the end, you'll see the speed doesn't change and it just loops right over because this spins around one full rotation. And you can see this is kind of blocky. So you can select your plane and right click and shade smooth and that'll make it a little smoother. Up here, we're gonna select uh, material preview. A lot of people in other videos will call this look dev. And this is basically supposed to be like a preview mode that has um, an HDRI loaded in it already. So we basically have this image of a forest loaded in here by default. Um, that will give us some more complex reflections. With that selected still, you want to go over here to the material properties, add a new material. And I'm just going to turn metallic all the way up. And now our plane is metallic. And I'm just going to turn the roughness down to something maybe like 0.1. And you can see it's very reflective now. Now I'm going to hit zero to set up our camera. And I'm going to go to view, lock camera to view. And I'm just going to find a spot that looks good. And you can hit play to play it. And I think this looks pretty good, so I'm going to unlock our camera right there. Another cool thing about using an object as our texture coordinates is you can um, scale that also. So if you want the texture to be bigger, you can actually just select your empty and scale that up like this. And that'll kind of make it look slower. And so this is how I made that animation. Um, basically, when you render this, instead of rendering it with the render tab up here, you want to render with the viewport. So you would select viewport render animation like I showed before. Just before you do that, make sure you turn off your gizmos and your overlays. 
so they don't show up in your final render. Okay, so that's it for this one. I'm thinking the next beginner video will be about character animation and digging deeper into the graph editor. But comment below what you'd like to see the most. And hit subscribe so you don't miss those either. Most of my videos are more intermediate, so if you want something more complicated, check those out. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.